Hey everyone, it's a Fast 15 plus a bonus five today. We're excited to welcome Joe Brazier. Joe leads Microsoft's K-12 strategy on the worldwide education team. He works closely with education industry colleagues and device teams to help refine, develop, and deliver Microsoft's vision for the ever-evolving landscape of K-12 education. Prior to taking this role, he spent over a decade working in special education at all levels of the K-12 system. He spent that time providing technology access and skills for students with social, cognitive, and physical obstacles to the typical learning experience. This passion for equity and inclusion continues in his work building a more inclusive education experience for all. Join me in welcoming Joe Brazier to the Fast 15. Joe Brazier, so happy that you're here with us to discuss technology and ed tech and how we can meet the needs of students with disabilities. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited and happy to have this conversation. The areas of technology and special education and especially how we can really be creative to support all students is something that I've held very close to my to my heart and and kept with me along my career. So happy to have this discussion today. Thank you. Well, yeah, I really did want to just find out what your journey was to begin you know, getting into the field of special education. What is that experience? Where did it start? What's kind of the inspiration behind your journey? Uh, Special education was not on my radar. I had the opportunity to coach at my old high school and I was doing different jobs and I wasn't going to college at the time. And I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to work with students. I want to work with kids. How do I get into this? And they said, well, you got to get your degree. You got to get your teaching credentials. And I'm like, done. So I went back to school. Okay. The quickest route to my undergrad was a history degree, which I found out that I love. And so in doing that, I was thinking I wanted to work in schools eventually, so I should start working in schools now. And as I was looking at different assistant roles, there was this one called paraeducator, which was like a few more cents more an hour. So I was like, cool, I'll go do that. Right. The first classroom that I walked into was an elementary school classroom as a para sub. And the teacher looked at me and she said, are you the sub? You want a job? <laughs> and I said, I, I, I don't even know what I'm doing yet. Right. I'm just, first time I walked in, but you can't see me. I'm a six foot former college athlete, former as in like decades ago now. Okay. But I would walk into these classrooms and they have these very great ladies would look at me and they would look at one of their most challenging students and they'd be like, I think you can help me right. with that student. What that ended up being a lot of times was a lot of data tracking on paper, a lot of these things. And I was trying to find ways to make that easier for okay. me as a person going around doing that. How can I make the most out of that and actually see, make that data make sense a little bit easier. And so once upon a time, I was just doing something as simple as taking that paper data and tally marks, putting it into Excel and using conditional formatting to see frequency data, right? Something pretty straightforward. And then being able to watch the decisions made off of that was very interesting. And even the questions that it brought up was very interesting. So I kind of walked into a special ed classroom and never walked out. It wasn't on my radar. I went okay. to I went to get my teaching degree to be a football coach. And I have coached at zero minutes of really? football because special education kind of grasped a hold of me and never let go. That's amazing. And I, I'm really curious about that interpretation of the data that you were collecting. One, mm-hmm. wh- was everybody expected to do it? Or was that something that came innately through kind of just how you work, how how you want to see progress and monitor that and know what was happening with the students? Was that a classroom thing or was that a Joe thing? It was a Joe thing. And I was a parent. So it wasn't right. like I was old to do anything. I was, okay. I had all this paper and I had some time. And so I started to do that. So when I got into my own classroom, within a couple of weeks of doing the same thing, I was like, there's got to be not only a better way to interpret the data, but a better way to collect the data and and do that because paper gets lost very easily. Yes. So it was one of those things where it took so much off of my plate. It allowed for more accuracy and, and it allowed me to take the strategies that I knew were effective and leverage technology to make it really come to life. So I had the opportunity because I work with such challenging students to work with some very good specialists. And one that I've always held what they said was you can do anything for a week. That's yeah. right. So they'd have me implement new things. They could do anything for a week. And the other was 
getting on the same page with any and everybody collecting data on the student. So I worked very closely with a couple and it might be me and another person. So understanding what we were collecting was important so that we were on the same page and we knew what we were doing. Right. And I took that to my classroom, to my parents. So we would always have conversations on what does each thing mean? And we'd be very clear that way I could perform the interventions for the student and somebody else could collect the data or vice versa. And we all knew what we were doing and it was very quick and easy to collect it. And so then making it from collection to visualization and interpretation and discussion was this very clean and clear path all the way across and through. And so it wasn't a, a directive given to me. I just saw the value and the impact of it. And it made so many things easier. And the ABA therapists and the other specialists that I worked with were like, we haven't seen anybody do this. And I haven't found a quote unquote autism app that ever set anything up like that. Yeah. But it was just something that for particular students and the things that they needed, it was leveraging the technology along with the strategies that I knew worked just made right. it highly valuable. It's so impactful hearing you have that vision for what the visualization should look like and then passing it along right. to the other paraeducators and having a team approach to have your data make sense and be taken with fidelity, right? Mm -hmm. And to then inform where you were heading with the with the students in their progress through whatever curricula you were working through. What what kind of programming were you engaged in at the start? Was it a set program? Where did you find out about functional academics? What was that journey like for you as you worked through meaningful curriculum? Well, my my first interaction with functional academics was a training that okay. my district had purchased the curriculum. And I remember meeting Candy Steyer and she loved put technology in it to kind of make it come to life. And okay. I kind of always remembered that. And so it was both of them working in conjunction that really built this curriculum. And it was the ABA piece of it that I kind of connected with of how can I very quickly track what's going on and then be able to ask and have a discussion about that afterwards, as right. opposed to collecting everything and yes. have it be anecdotal and subjective. How can I, I very quickly get a gauge of what's going on and have that be the basis of the discussion that we can have later. And so worked with that. And then two years later, our district kind of came back together to see how we were implementing it. And myself and the two other teachers were doing it all differently. Right. Okay. And so it's like, oh, we needed to kind of be a bit more on track with this. But I think I took more of an ABA approach because I had several of those working in my classroom or coming into my classroom. Oh, okay. So that data collection piece of it was always a, a key component and a key piece for me of how can I do that within this curriculum much right. quicker, much easier at all times, anywhere, everywhere, all at the same time. What a powerful story that you're telling and in your own journey for how a paraeducator with the vision for data collection to inform the instructors, what a value add that you had to the whole team in the classroom. So, so take us from the classroom and can you tell about that bridge to really what you're doing now? You were in the classroom for, was it how many years? Nine? I was, a total it was about a decade and a half, but I, I spent years as a para. And then I had, I was certified for in my own classroom for seven before deciding to try to move on to admin and, and different opportunities. But that early connection to technology to ease things had me always looking for what was available. What could I do to build skills with my students? How could I do the things that we're doing much more efficiently instead of grabbing tape cassettes and putting them in a thing and having kids sit with, with headphones? Maybe we could use iTunes and we would have iPads at the time and we could always have access to all the things that the students needed at all times. And so it was always looking for things that okay. we could use. So that connection kind of brought me to somebody who I knew that worked at Microsoft Education and we had several discussions. And then I went on a, a weird rant one time. I don't know if it's a rant. I sent him a discombobulated voicemail when I first saw the HoloLens. And I had a couple students who were going to be coming to my classroom the following year okay. on the spectrum, needed visual schedules. And, and, you know, if I could do anything to not have to print out laminate Velcro things to my wall. I would yes. have done anything for that. Yes. And I remember sending him a voicemail saying, I don't know how much this HoloLens thing costs. I said, you got to get me two. I've got the perfect student for it. And I essentially laid out an education pitch for a tool and a product that wasn't designed for education. Okay. Especially for special education, because yeah. there's this whole idea that we have to get our students to adapt to the world. 
And what if we could adapt the world to our students? What if I could get them to move about the world the way that they're used to, and I could just augment? And I think we're all kind of at this point familiar with augmented augmented reality mm -hmm. with things right. like that. And yes. even the Vision Pro Quest or the Vision Pro that, that Apple has out now, we're accustomed to that idea of placing things in the world. They will always be there for me and really personalizing it for me. But it wasn't something that was really talked about back then. So he later told me after I've been working with him for a year, he's like, that was one of those things that I needed somebody who thought about not just cutting edge technology, but technology in general. And how do we bring it into this education space with a very student centric approach? Right. And now that's innovative that, that, you know, that is where we need to go. And that's how we make it really person centered. Mm -hmm. Right. I know that Microsoft is a trailblazer in their accessibility tools. So can you highlight for me and for our listeners some of the key initiatives that or projects that Microsoft is working on and, or that you're doing? What is that looking like right now for individuals with disabilities? And, you know, what is that intersection of technology and accessibility? How is that transforming the learning experience for our community that we're wanting to serve? I think that there's there's a lot of very cool things that are going on. And I, I want to try to focus them into two areas, okay. one in removing stigma and the other in removing barriers. And that idea of removing stigma is that when everybody has access to it, when it's built in and not an additional add-on, when it's the same device, the same look, and you have access to a wealth of accessibility tools and modification abilities built into there, then nobody feels like they're set apart. Nobody feels like they are marginalized and, and right. nobody feels like, oh, well, I need this separate, different thing in order to do what you're doing. So right. I'm not as good or I'm, I'm different than anyone else. And I always think about Syndrome from The Incredibles, who says, when everybody is special, then no one is, right? Okay. So if everybody has access to the tools and everybody can do it, then you don't feel like you're less than because you need other tools. It's just, I'm using the same device and these tools are built in just like anybody else. They right. may need it. I may not. It's all the same. So that's, that's one thing. And we've got a lot of tools like our immersive reader and our accessibility features that are in the settings that many people don't know about, yes. but it, it allows you to augment your interaction with the tool in a way that doesn't mean you need something different, right? Even being able to control it with your eyes without needing a different device is a great tool that you can do. Right. The other one is removing barriers, right? Helping anybody be able to interact with the technology, whether it is, I need to use my eyes, I need to use my voice, I need to use a set of switches, I need something else, is thinking holistically about how we remove those barriers for people. And in thinking of that, yeah. one of the barriers to helping students and helping get those interventions be productive and helping students grow and accelerate their learning is that access to data, right? How do we remove those barriers to being able to see and track and monitor how our students are doing? And that's where something like our learning accelerators comes in. Student reads on their own in front of their computer, all that data, all that information comes to the teacher. I can update it, change it, review it. I can now track it. But I didn't have to pull the students out of the class into the hallway. Be in order to assess it. Outside. Exactly. And so what we're seeing is that when I did this in the last school that I worked at, we assessed all the students in their reading to get them grouped into the right students. And it was an elementary school, it took two and a half. Okay. What we're seeing with something like reading coach and learning accelerators is people are doing it a couple of times a week. And so kids are, you're tracking much more regularly and that removing barriers to accessing data that you can make decisions on is not gone, but it's, it's re removing those. So you can see it more often. You can adjust it more often. You can see how the students are growing. They're like, they had a dip, but they grew, they accelerated, they moved to this group, they moved to that group. That way you don't feel that, oh, I'm in a remedial reading group is a life sentence. You are now able to move the cabin. You're now able to move about the country freely and do the things that you want to do and drive your own learning. All of the students are being assessed the same way, right? I mean, that's that's exactly what you're saying. Without the pull out, we're not singling out. We're we're including in and and make it making it a, a whole group activity, whole group experience and access mm -hmm. equally across across the student population and, we're working with. And the other thing that where the, the stigma really gets removed is really interesting because you reminded me as you're saying not getting through getting assessed on the same thing. Yes. Is you can 
have the same story leveled for students, right? Because as a middle school special education teacher, it was always difficult. How do I find something that is similar to what the other students are reading, but at the level that students need it at? How do I right. do that? And that's right. one of the really exciting things that I think we have the opportunity to look at moving forward is getting that content, getting that reading story and putting it at the level, the reading level the student's at so that they feel included, so that they are keeping track of the same story, so that they can have those conversations with their peers. Right. Yes. Oh, I love that. And and hopefully we'll be able to get some links that for people to find out more information about those things, we'll link those into the show notes and make sure that is widely understood and known or just people have access to those tools and, and really learning more about what's available to them. Right. Well, I wanted to ask you this too. So in the realm of, of functional academics and skill development, how do you see technology contributing to the greater independence of, of individuals with disabilities? I want to know kind of what your specific ideas with, with tools or features that, that are out there designed to enhance functional academics and daily living skills. What, how, do you see, how do you see technology and independent living? Um, the executive functioning piece. Yes. And, and I'm, I'm thinking of executive function as, as one of the things in my head, because there's all these things around what is it do I, that I need to accomplish today and how do I go about doing it? Those are just that process right there is something that we work very closely with students and some where I was able to pick it up pretty easily. Others needed more support. And I even work with my, my own high schoolers on that. They were very academically gifted, very good. Sometimes there's a struggle to make sure that, you know, how do I set up this thing for success? I have a project. How do I go about it? And so we'd see that a lot with some of our students of they don't initiate, right? They don't get started. Transitions are difficult. And even just being able to know what do I have going on and how do I get going right. is, is difficult. So I, I often remind people Microsoft is a productivity company that, to help with that. And it's not just the computer, but you know, I think something like Copilot that's built into Windows specifically is one of those things that can really help. And you you think about, hey, play some music for me, or I'm, I need to focus. Let me get it in a focus mode. And then you, it does the things for you that you normally would. Snaps your, your Windows, it uh, puts it in dark mode, it plays your, your playlist to get you going so that those are three things you don't have to do and get distracted while doing, right? Right. Yeah, you can, you can just have that going. I think about the the functional aspect of speech to text yes. and text to speech. That conversational people are like, oh, well, this app doesn't have it. It's like, well, it's built into the operating system. So if you can type anywhere, your voice can can do that, right? Your voice can type there for you. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think about the many different ways that we interact with and communicate with others. We should be able to interact with and control and, and leverage our devices to do the things that we need them to do. Technology has you advance to a place to where it becomes really easy, right? It advanced to a place to where touchscreen became the primary mode of, of interacting with things. That works for many people, but not everyone, right? right? Maybe yes. you need a switch and a macro and, and a set of, of shortcuts. Maybe you need to use your eyes. Maybe you need to use your voice or some combination of that. But it should be very much personalized for you. It right. should not be unexpected. I have the device here and I type with my fingers. It should be the device is your window into engaging with the world and the things that you need to do. And so thinking functionally about, and even like occupational therapists think about helping students interact with the world, I think helping them figure out how to interact with their technology and the jobs that that opens up is important. Yeah. Um, being able to get past the, can you do this thing to what are the skills you actually hold is an important part looking for it functionally. That's so well said, Joe. We want to make sure that we're always keeping all of these things in mind. What do we need to do to make sure that we're teaching functional skills meaningfully leading toward the greatest level of independence? Yes. Well, listeners, that's it for today's episode of The Fast 15. But real quick, let's remember just a few key points from Joe's discussion with us today. Number one, if everybody has access to the tools and everybody can do it, then you don't feel like you're less than because you need other tools. And then number two, he also said, if you design something for one, you can be designing for all. And then number three, don't be afraid 
to just try some tools slowly if you're new to technology and just get a vision for what a functional future looks like. Well, you guys, I hope you have a great day and we will check in next week with our second part with Joe Frazier on educational technology used with special education and finding the right accessibility tools to make life functional and meaningful for an independent future. A heartfelt thank you to our generous sponsors, specially designed education services, publishers of the Functional Academics Program. Please take a moment to learn more about the only true comprehensive functional academics program that enables students with moderate to severe disabilities to improve their ability to live independently and show meaningful growth both academically and personally while creating accountability with data-driven, evidence-based results. Visit sdesworks.com to learn more.